Hello and welcome. Today we're working on the S&P 500, the return over the last uh, 95 years, and then the risk. So what is our risk versus what is our return on the S&P 500? So let's get started. My name's Jeff from Finally Learn, where I help you finally learn financial literacy like Excel, investing, so on. So the S&P 500 is the 500 largest U.S. stocks. There are many of them you know, multinational stocks multinational companies. We've got uh, data from 1928 all the way through 2022. And I've also added the treasury bonds and treasury bills from the U.S. government. So what happens here is we can see the risk and return. Usually more return comes with, with more risk. That's just a basic idea in life or in uh, finance or whatever. So can you invest in the S&P 500? Well, not directly. You can invest in S&P 500 index funds that basically buy the entire index at a low cost. So here are some ticker symbols. And that's really the investment that Warren Buffett recommends. Uh, he's the chairman of Berkshire Hathaway. All right, so the link is in the description if you want to see a data set and kind of work on this yourself. So another way to look at the returns and the risk is look at just the actual returns and plot it on a graph. And here we have all the green is positive and all the red is negative. Uh, I think I counted about once out every about four years or four and a half years looks like there's a negative return. So that's the risk if you invest in the S&P 500. So why would you do it? Well, let's calculate risk and return over the entire 95 years. Then we'll do a portfolio for 40 years, which might be more typical, obviously, of a person in their investing lifetime or whatever. All right, so let's assume that we put in $1,000. And so I'm gonna put in $1,000, and we'll make it um, absolute with dollar sign, so I can copy it across. So let's have three different portfolios, and we'll calculate the returns and the risk on those three portfolios. So for in 1928, we start with 1,000. And then we're going to multiply that times 1 plus the rate of return that we have in 1928 for stocks. Close my parentheses here, and you can see, well, if we got a 43% return, then we've increased our $1,000 by, uh, by $438. And we're going to copy this all the way down. We're going to do the same thing for bonds and bills and we can copy those down. So it's easy, it's probably do uh, Excel because it's easy to calculate. So it looks like it's a 0.8% return. Let's look at this for bonds, 0.84, and then a 3% for treasury bills, there's a 3% return. Okay, so there we see it can go up and it can go down. And so let's see how this works. What's the future value? What's the ending value of these portfolios? Well, let's go to the very bottom and you have over 95 years, well, that's a long time, obviously. You've got, uh, you would have 6,245,000. And bonds and bills, you'd have 70,000 and 21,000. Until you do the math on this, until you run the numbers, I don't think people realize how big a difference uh, stocks and bonds and bills would be. These are actual returns over those many, many years. Now remember, inflation has been an important part of our our history, um, even a low rate of two or three percent, then your your dollars lose three percent of their value every year. So, with treasury bills, you probably you're just keeping up with inflation, and uh, you'd have to pay tax on that. So, after tax returns are probably below um, uh, the inflation rate. All right. So, what is the average return? Well, we, this is not the really way we do it, but this is a quick and easy way we can figure this out. So the average return, so I'm going to type in average, start my parentheses here, and I'm going to select the entire S&P uh, 500 here, go all the way to the bottom, close my parentheses, and here we have uh, 11.51 is the average rate of return if you take all the returns and just average them. Same thing with bonds and bills. And so that's the average, but this is not how we describe our annual return or our CAGR, 
compounded annual growth rate. So here's how we do that. Um, the easiest way to do it is the RRI function. So I'm going to do the FX here and I'm search for RRI and I need the number of periods. Well, I do know it's 95, so I'm going to put 95 in. The present value started at 1,000 and the future value ended at 6.2 million. What kind of rate of return are you getting? Well, you're getting something like uh, 9.64 is our annual rate of return. So this is what you would quote rather than 11.5. The average is going to be always a little bit higher than the actual annualized rate of return or the compound and annual growth rate. We're going to copy this across and so what you see is when stocks returned 9.64, bonds returned about uh, 4.6 and bills about 3.3 but it led to a complete difference over 95 years this makes a huge difference. 70,000 to 6.2 million is dramatic. You need to see this. Now, over our lifetime, uh, we're probably not investing over 95 years, but it's still a dramatic difference a lot of times. Now, what's the downside? Well, the downside is um, the one way to calculate the risk is standard deviation. So we can take this and calculate standard deviation. I'm going to use the uh, dot S, which is the sample standard deviation. I'm going to go to the very top here and take this entire column. What is our risk? Well, one way to measure risk is the standard deviation. So 19.6 and you see bonds and bills have a much lower standard deviation, much lower risk, but the problem is you're not keeping up with inflation. Uh, you're not increasing purchasing power. Um, here on bills, you're probably behind after tax. So you try to, why do you invest? You try to invest now so you have more purchasing power in the future. And if you don't have more purchasing power in the future, then that's a real problem. One thing uh, when we have, um, I'm recording this in um, August of 2023, and people say, man, things are expensive, but that's the point of inflation, right? Our dollars are cheaper now and we're taking more dollars to buy the equivalent goods. You can think the prices have gone up, but it's really our dollars that have become less valuable. Another way to look at the risk is, can we calculate the five worst years on this 95? You know, what's the possibility uh, our, our returns would be really, really negative or whatever, really bad? So we're gonna use a function called small. So I'm gonna search up here uh, small, and I'm going to do the absolutely the um, five smallest ones. So our array is going to be our data set at the very top. So there's our data set. Um, I'm going to make it absolute value here. So that means I'm going to put dollar signs in front of uh, the, the B and the 2 and so on. All right, and we're going to point to the number one. So this is the smallest one of all these. And then I'll copy this down. All right, so our worst five years out of 95 years, we lost almost 44%, 37, 36 and a half percent, 35 percent. So is it possible you could lose 25 or 35 or 45 percent in a given year? Yes. These negative returns are included in these total returns here. So that's why there's a standard deviation that's higher. That's the risk. But the returns over a long period of time uh, looks like it's more valuable, right? We can do the same thing. I'm going to copy this uh, and try to make a um, similar one here. So we're going to point to the one. And this needs to be in column C, so I'm just going to edit this, column C. So the worst, let me make sure here, C in column C is the, um, the bonds. So if you had a bond portfolio, 100% treasury bonds, you would lose money, but the the amount of the loss would be much less, but remember you're getting um, you know, almost 5%, about 
less each year. And so, yeah, you don't have those negative losses uh, that are large, but your return overall is smaller. Let's do the same thing for the treasury bills. Let's copy those over and point to that. And this is going to be the column D, column D. And so think about this. If you did the treasury bills, theoretically, you haven't lost any money. You, you only earn 0.03, and you look at your friends that have stocks, like, oh, well, my return is 0.03, so I made money, and you lost 43, almost 44%. Well, it looks like you're not taking any risk, and you're, you're being really smart, but really, you're not getting any kind of return. That's not really investing. That's just using, essentially, like a savings account or a... Um, certificate of deposit, a CD. All right, so here what we have, and let's think about what we know here. Over a long period of time, looks like stocks have a greater return, but also a greater risk. And you could suffer through some of these years. If you know this, I remember 2008, we lost 36.5%. And yeah, we know that's a very possi uh, possibility, and that happens. Um, and you have a loss about, on average, every four or five years. And then sometimes, you know, those, those losses could happen uh, two out of three years on, on some particular time. So it goes in streaks and runs and things like that. All right, let's look at a portfolio of what if. What if we have a mixture of stocks and bonds? So this, I'm going to do a 40-year um, return. I'm going to use the historical numbers from 1983 to... 2022. So the last 40 years of return. So your portfolio is probably not going to be 100% stocks or 100% bonds. We'll calculate it where you can uh, show how this works. All right, so here's what we're going to do. What I did was I made it where we can do 100% stocks and 100% um, bonds or whatever. So this is the stock column. And let's start out at 50-50. So if this is 50, then we'll take 1 minus the 50%. So if we're adding 50% stocks, we'll have 50% bonds. That's how it works. So here we're going to take uh, the 1,000 times the 50%. So we're going to invest in a portfolio of 1,000. It would be 500 in stocks, 500 in bonds. So we'll have the 1,000 times the second 50%. And we're just going to add this up. We'll take the sum of these two. We have 1,000, and there's no return. You know, we just invest that first year. So what we're going to do is calculate um, an annual rebalancing of going back to 50-50. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 1,000, the previous 1,000, and I'm going to multiply it times the 50%. I'm going to make that absolute, which I mean put the dollar sign B and dollar sign 4. So I always want it to be 50%. And then I'm going to take that number times 1 plus, and I need to find 1983's number. We would earn 22.34%. So I'm going to close that parentheses. So what happens is if we earn 22%, 500 would grow to 612. We're going to do the same thing for the bonds. I'm going to take the preceding 1,000 times the 50%, which is the bond factor. We'll make it absolute. And then that times 1 plus whatever the bond 1983, 3.2%, close that parentheses. So what we're going to have is, we're going to have each year, we're going to rebalance. So this 1128, we're going to rebalance to 5050. So I can copy this down. Let's do one more, and then we can just copy it all the way down. So what we have is, we're going to take the 1128 times 50% times whatever the return is for 1984, okay? 
So now I can just copy these all the way down and we'll have a portfolio value at the end of 40 years. So here, that $1,000 grew to $32,000. Not as impressive as the $6 million, but we're talking about 40 years rather than 95. So here, I just uh, point to the very last one. So if we did this 50-50, then we have 32,780. Now let's calculate a return. We'll take the 1128 divided by the 1000 minus the one, we take out the one here. And so we've got a 12.8% return that year if we did 50-50. Okay, so let's calculate everything and then we'll have the ability to go back and change this to 50%, 60%, 100%, 0%, so on. So what is our average annual return? Well, our average, I'm just take all these numbers and add them up. Take the average here, so the average return is 9.57. So our annual return, our compounded annual growth rate, CAGR, is gonna be a little bit less than that. So let's calculate this as, we're gonna use RRI. So here we have RRI, number of periods, we know it's 40. The present value is gonna be uh, the 1,000 that we start with. Let me do, um, yeah, that's fine, the 1,000 there. And the future value is gonna be 32,000. All right, now what happens is our calculated um, annual return is 9.1%. So not quite 10%, 9.12 um, is our annual return if we had a 50-50 portfolio. Now, what if we change it to 100% stocks? Well, 0% bonds, then our return is 68,000. So our return is a little bit higher. Instead of it being about 9%, it's about 11%. So it makes a difference. Um, let's go back to 50-50 here. What is our standard deviation? You've seen me do the standard deviation before, so let's do this and calculate it. So it is 9.95, about 10%. Remember, our standard deviation for stocks was about 19.6, so if you had a 50-50 portfolio, then you've reduced your standard deviation maybe down to 10%. So having some stocks, having some bonds that reduces your um, risk might be helpful for you. Let's look at the worst five years. Okay, I had a little bit of issue with doing the smallest five years, so uh, I did it and then came back here. So our worst years are these five, if we have, remember we have a 50-50 uh, portfolio. So we could do a little what if, what if it's 70%, 30%, you see we have a little bit lower return than 100%, but a little more than 50%. So one thing we can do is, we can calculate a little table here, and we'll do, this little table will be the last thing we do in terms of, let's calculate the annual return, the standard deviation, and the future value at 0% stocks all the way through 100% stocks. So here is what I will do here. The annual return is 9.12. The standard deviation is gonna be the 9.95. And the future value is gonna be the 32,780. But what would it be at 0%, 10%, 20, on and on and on? So this is a data table. So I'm gonna highlight all the data table. I'm gonna to go to the data ribbon, a what if analysis, a data table, and this column that's zero through 100%, I'm gonna to point to the 50%, and here it will give us a little chart, and this is the last thing we can do. The more stocks we have, the higher the return as a percentage, the higher the standard deviation is as a percentage, and the higher the future value is gonna be. So that's how you calculate the annual risk and return uh, for the S&P 500 over the last 95 years. Hey, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.